Welcome back to Sensitivity Sessions, where we talk about how to find ease and purpose as a highly sensitive person in an overstimulating world. I'm Stephanie Gardner-Wright, your host, and I'm a licensed therapist and coach for highly sensitive people. Today on the show, we're talking about feeling intense feelings of disconnection and isolation from other folks because of how deeply we experience the world. So there's usually several things going on here and they might take a little teasing apart. It's complex. You know, when we're feeling this intense disconnection from the world or this intense isolation where it feels like no one else can experience or touch into how deeply we're experiencing something and so they can't really understand how we're we're feeling. There's usually multiple things going on. So one of those things is often related to the explicit and the implicit messages that we got usually in childhood. So Explicit messages just meaning not that they're, you know, adult only or X-rated, but mean they are explicitly said we have no doubt what that person is thinking because they're sharing it with us versus implicit messaging where it's not spoken. It's about the way that someone is non-verbally responding to us and giving us a message that way. So this is incredibly impactful for many highly sensitive kids who now are highly sensitive adults because we are so attuned to what's happening with other people. Our brains in fMRI studies are having more activity in the regions of the brain that respond to socialization and to other people. So we are wired for connection. People in general are wired for connection, but we are have more of a heightened awareness of that than folks that are maybe less sensitive on the sensitivity continuum because every single human on earth is on that continuum of sensitivity. We're just at the high end. We're at the end of one of those bell curves. So we really can take to heart these explicit and implicit messages that we get growing up about our sensitivity because it's usually negative messaging. Messaging like, why are you so sensitive? It's not that big of a deal. Stop crying about that. You're thinking about this too deeply or you're seeing things. There's nothing there. You're just making stuff up. You're dramatic. These are all explicit messages that folks can get in childhood or adulthood from other people. And and this could be from parent people or other caregivers. As we get older into the school years, this can be from peers at school, other students or from teachers. And actually, it might feel like, well, it shouldn't be that impactful. It's just another student. But developmentally, what happens for us as we move into those school-aged years is our peers become even more important to us and their opinion of us as well as other authority figures at times. So we may actually put more weight on those statements as we get older than we might on what a parent would say. So that's just some food for thought there. And the implicit messages that we might get are maybe if we had, for instance, really strong feelings about something as a child. Say we were crying about something and a parent or caregiver kind of gave us a look and went and rolled their eyes, you know, had a big sigh with the kind of nonverbal messaging of here we go again. That really can make a child feel alone, unheard, unseen. Maybe a parent never said anything negative about the way that we experience the world or the way that we deeply felt. And maybe they didn't roll their eyes, but maybe there was no response. Maybe there was no reaction. So maybe there was more of a stone face where there was no expression when a child would be upset. And that is incredibly dysregulating to children in general. But children that are highly sensitive will experience that typically even more intensely than a child who's less sensitive. So if we have a caregiver, for instance, who is depressed, maybe you have a mother who has postpartum depression and she's not able to really show delight in her infant, for example. She's not able to smile at the baby because of the depression. She's not able to demonstrate to the baby, because babies very much pick up on this, by the way, those physical 
feelings of safety. You know, I am delighted by your presence. I'm happy you're here. Even little babies can pick up on those things. And if we don't get that, if we are not having an adult to help us regulate with co-regulation, because when we're very small children and infants, we can't self-regulate yet. We depend on an adult for that, a caregiver. And so if a caregiver struggles for various reasons to help us co-regulate in that way and regulate down our nervous system when we're feeling scared, when we're feeling overwhelmed, if they can't do that for us, then we will become flooded by those emotions and we will be alone with those and having to deal with them, being stuck in them. So this is one facet of why we could feel this intense sense of isolation as adults if we haven't been attuned to as children and we haven't been given this safe and secure base by whatever caregiver is in the picture. And we haven't been told either verbally or non-verbally that we are fine just the way we are. You know, very Mr. Rogers style. He was pretty brilliant when it came to child development. He really got young children in that. He would say on his show, right, if you've ever watched it, he would say, I like you just the way you are. That's the message that children need to hear, that they are acceptable and they are fine just as they are. That helps them to safely attach to a caregiver. And that message may be given verbally. Again, it may be given non-verbally, but when it's not given at all, or when it's given in the opposite, so a child gets the impression that they are not liked just as they are, then that's a huge problem. So again, back to the explicit or the implicit messages that we may have gotten about how we are as a sensitive person, our deeper perception of things, how we deeply feel things, maybe intense emotions as a child, or maybe being intensely bothered by something for a long time and caregivers not understanding that. Those can be ways that a child feels shut out, that they feel I am misunderstood or I am not understood at all by this important person in my life. And they can't verbalize that. You know, children are not able to verbalize that, but they're very aware. They can very much pick up on that sense of not enoughness, of not belonging in some way. And we may not be aware of this consciously in our adulthood, but this is something that can absolutely impact almost every facet of our lives, especially with close relationships. The audience question that came in about this actually mentioned feeling this intense sense of isolation, even in, especially in, close relationships. So I just want to speak to that for a minute because our adult relationships are actually how we are attached. So our attachment, when we think of attachment, we often think of young children, babies, and their parents which is true, but as adults, we also have attachment needs. And that simply means we need to belong. We need to feel like we belong somewhere. We are seen for who we are and we are accepted for who we are. And we haven't felt that at some point in our lives, maybe for a long time, you know, all through childhood, or maybe there've been some really impactful moments that have caused us to question whether we're okay just as we are, then we can start to self-censor and shut ourselves down in relationships because it doesn't feel safe to truly show up as who we are. We may have a fear of expressing the fullness of our emotions to really be vulnerable with someone, partner or a close friend, even after we've been with them for many years, perhaps it doesn't feel safe to truly genuinely share with them how we feel for fear that they're going to leave us, that they will either physically leave us or that they will emotionally distance from us, especially if this has been an experience growing up, which is incredibly impactful for children, as we've talked about. It's complex. This is one facet of censoring ourselves or holding back somewhat because we fear that it won't be safe to truly show up for who we completely are, fully feel our emotions, to cry in front of someone close with us, to admit even that we feel as deeply as we do or that we intuit things like we do or that we're deeply thinking about something 
thing that they wouldn't personally think about as deeply can all foster the sense of intense isolation from the rest of the world. This feeling that I'm different in some way from other people. They wouldn't understand me. No one would like me if they knew who I really was. Even that may be a belief that's underlying some of these things as well. And so we may feel really unable to connect authentically with the world if there may be a feeling that we are putting on a face for other people to see and that we're not going to let them see behind that face. And this is a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's completely understandable why we might do this, why we are shielding ourselves from the pain that we felt in the past from rejection, from feeling like we're going to be ostracized. I mean, really, humans for thousands of years have depended life or death survival on being accepted by the group. So even now, this instinct is very present in our modern world where it feels like a matter of life and death that we be accepted. And really, at an emotional level, it is. We thrive on connection. We need connection with others. And the feeling that we might be cut off from that can can feel as bad as dying. So it makes sense why we would pull back or withhold ourselves in some way or maybe show up as a version of ourselves that isn't the most authentic. Maybe we have amplified one facet of who we are and not to say it's not who we are, but maybe it isn't really the most genuine version of us that we have done that in order to feel like other people are going to accept us. But under that, there may be a deep fear of if they knew the real me, they'd never talk to me again, or they wouldn't understand me. And we may mask as highly sensitive people. This is extremely common for neurodivergent folks. And that goes for highly sensitive people too, since we're between 15 to 30% of the entire population, which is not insubstantial, but at the same time, it means that most people are not going to have the same experience of the world as you are. And so one way that this can show up is at work. This is a common way that we might mask who we are as highly sensitive people because, say, for instance, there's fluorescent lighting in your work and you can't focus on a single thing because that lighting is so intense. You can you know, hear that horrific little noise that fluorescent lights can make that is hard to tune out at times. And maybe the fluorescent lighting is actually depleting your energy in this example. But you may be afraid to say anything to your coworkers or your boss about moving to different desk or maybe about turning the fluorescent lighting off and having a more calming lighting situation because you don't want to be perceived as a dramatic or as a problem child, as someone who's finicky, whatever the context may be about that, that you feel like you have to lump it and deal with it instead of asking for something to be different. So this is another way that we can subtly isolate ourselves from the rest of the world because we can sense, oh, this isn't bothering other people. And so So maybe it shouldn't be bothering me either. I just have to deal with it. And I just want to compassionately challenge you to look at that belief if that rings true for you. You Maybe it's about fluorescent lights for you. Maybe it's about something else entirely. But this belief that we just have to suck it up and deal with it, it's kind of that toxic strength pose that we can get into where we've been so misunderstood for being sensitive that we overcompensate by either physically becoming strong and or being like Teflon. You know, I'm going to pretend this doesn't bother me. It rolls right off of me. That way people aren't going to make fun of me or think that I'm weird for this thing getting to me that doesn't seem to bother them. So it actually can be a really unhelpful way for us to interact with the world because not only are we suppressing our emotions, which has physical health ramifications, our emotions actually can manifest in the body. But it also can increase the sense of isolation from other people because we're not authentically showing up as ourselves. And there's this sense that other people will judge us if they know the real us. So this is a way that these beliefs that we may have can actually increase our sense of isolation from other people because we are afraid that if we try to get closer, 
they're going to pull back. So what can someone do who's feeling incredibly isolated from not only the world around them, but also from close friends and family? Baby steps is often best. So one of the ways can be starting to identify within yourself ways that maybe you pull yourself back or you might keep yourself at an emotional distance or maybe even noticing if, if you catch yourself starting to feel a strong emotion and then maybe you notice I, I'm immediately putting a lid on that. I'm not going to feel that or perhaps you're in a disagreement with someone and instead of sharing how you truly feel you just kind of go silent or act like it's fine with you to preserve the peace. These are all ways that this can contribute to this sense of isolation. So starting with that of the awareness of how might I actually self-isolate myself from other people? Again, not as a criticism, but in a compassionate way of we are trying to protect ourselves. This is all a form of self-protection. This is a way we are trying to keep ourselves safe. There's nothing wrong about it. But also at the same time, we maybe have outgrown some of these things that perhaps it made us feel safer as a child and it's all we could do to get through. But now as adults, we have more resources potentially available to us. And another way is starting to practice with close others that you trust or that you trust enough that you know they're not going to mock you, that even if there's maybe thoughts that you have, worries that you might have that they won't understand, that you've seen from their behavior that they're kind, they're empathetic enough, they are well-meaning, and even if they don't always say the right thing, they want to be helpful. So those are the type of people that you would want to practice being more authentic and genuine with. And you can even be upfront about that if it feels safe. You could say something like, you know, I've been realizing lately that I don't always fully share how I feel with you. And I'd like to begin practicing doing that if that's okay with you. Just to make that explicit and give them a heads up that this is something new that you're going to be doing. Or you could simply practice at um letting yourself show more emotion around them or reflecting out loud, you know, wow, I'm really touched by this or I'm really, really find myself worrying about this thing just so that you can start being more genuine about how deeply you actually do experience things. And this may be as well an educational process. So if you have people in your life that are not aware of the trait of high sensitivity, or they don't know that you're highly sensitive, perhaps you start by sharing a little bit about that and letting them in on the trait of high sensitivity. You might even say, hey, you know how I just kind of need to zonk and I need to just hang out and be quiet after a work day for a bit. Well, that's because of this trait of high sensitivity. I'm I'm deeply noticing things and I'm deeply processing all of these things through my day. And this is a normative part of this temperamental trait called high sensitivity. And so I need to recharge and just take some time to recoup from that when I get home. So that's a way that you can neutrally present this because it's a neutral trait, even if we may subjectively feel like there's something bad about having this trait because often when we are self-isolating, we have some negative belief about what it means for us to be sensitive. So that can be something to begin to look at. And another piece of this, of beginning to feel less isolated and more connected to important other people in our lives or the world in general, can be to start increasing our own comfort with feeling our emotions. So we might tend to get up in our heads and think deeply or, or ruminate on things we're feeling or are bothering us, or we might closet ourselves away while we're feeling something intense so that other people don't notice. But maybe by getting more comfortable with our own emotions, we can learn, oh, you know, this emotion is felt by me. The emotion is not taking me over. I think there's often this fear we have that the emotion is going to be so big that it's going to totally run us over like a tsunami and that we're not going to be able to withstand it if we fully feel the feeling. So learning to be with your emotions in that way, maybe you have some coping skills to go along with that. Maybe you're also working with a therapist and being able to 
hold that space or having a therapist hold that space for you where there's a safe container where you feel like I am the feeler of my emotions, not the other way around. They are not running the show. They will pass. And actually most emotions, when we fully turn to them and instead of shoving them down, instead of avoiding them or distracting ourselves from them, if we fully allow them to pass through us and feel them, whether that's anger or sadness about a particular thing, those are typically passing in about 90 seconds. So an emotion can't last much longer than that if we're not actively giving it fuel, which is if we're tamping it down, if we are not allowing ourselves to feel it, that energy will still be running in the background. And so we'll still be feeling that motion just uh, suppressed whether we want to or not. So challenging yourself gently, if it feels safe to begin allowing the feelings, to sit with the feelings, that will help you to feel like your emotions deserve some airtime and that they're not so intense that other people are going to be scared off by them, which is a big fear that we might have, especially if we were told as children, either verbally or non-verbally, that our emotions were too much, that our reactions were too intense, that the situation didn't warrant the response that we were having. All of those experiences often equal an adult who feels that their emotions are so intense that no one is ever going to want to be around them if they know how truly intense they feel them. And I would just encourage you to think of that as a younger part of yourself, potentially, that believes that we have all these different parts of ourselves that have experienced different things. We have our adult self, obviously, but then we also have all these experiences at a younger age. And some parts of ourselves might believe things that perhaps we logically know are not true, like that our emotions are so big that we're not going to be able to handle them. That's typically a belief that a younger child would have, but it's a belief that many of us have as adults because we've never been able to work through that for whatever reason. Maybe there wasn't the space or the safety to do that. So that's part of what people might refer to as reparenting ourselves, where we would become aware that a part of ourselves is coming online with that thought or that feeling, that physically felt sensation even, and we can turn our compassionate attention towards that and practice being with that emotion. Because when we can be with all parts of ourselves, ourself, and we can feel like it's safe to feel those uncomfortable emotions, then we maybe can become a little less worried that other people are not going to accept us. And this is a process. It didn't get this way overnight of feeling this intense isolation from the world. And so it won't get better overnight, which is okay. It's all about taking baby steps. It's all about being gentle with yourself and slowly but consistently working at being aware of maybe some of these beliefs and thoughts and feelings, as well as the physical sensations that go along with the feelings that we're having. So be gentle with yourself along this process and know that you're not alone. This is something that many highly sensitive people have experienced and struggle with. And there actually might be some people in your community that feel similarly and you may not even be aware of it. So, so I hope this was helpful. That's our show for today. Please like and subscribe to the show and I'll look forward to talking with you next time.